Good morning and welcome to the third day of hope. Welcome to everyone here in Queens and to everyone watching this around the world. At the end of everything today at six o'clock, we do have our closing ceremonies. We gladly invite everyone here to join us in person and everyone online to take part in the festivities as well. And now to our next talk. Cancer is the leading cause of death worldwide. In the US, the statistics are that one out of every two people will have cancer at some point in their lives, including me. I've, I've had cancer in the past. The way things are going in research, we'll never find a cure for it. We need a new way of thinking about this, a new approach. Our next speaker will explain what cancer really is, why so many get it, and why it's been so difficult to treat. Everyone, please welcome our next speaker, Kara Moon. Hi, I'm Kara Moon. Welcome to my talk for Hope 2022. It's called Hack Cancer, How Hackers Can Help Save 9.5 Million Lives a Year. I'm going to start by telling you a story. It's my story. It's a nightmare, really, but there's still a chance it could turn into a fairy tale. More on that later. So in July... Um, 2016, so it's uh, six years ago, I was suddenly diagnosed with terminal cancer. I was uh, 36 at the time, two young kids. Um, my son was eight and my daughter three. And I was not really given any time to live, a realistic Life expectancy was seven to nine months. That's with treatment. Uh, the cancer I had, or cancer I have, rather, is uh, bowel cancer, uh, colorectal cancer. One of the most common cancers and uh, one of the most common um, cancer killers in uh, most countries. Um, I found that the cancer had spread to the uh, abdominal membrane and that's why the life expectancy was really seven to nine months realistically. I quickly found out that in the UK there was no serious treatment being offered. Um, I could have some treatment to help extend my life a bit, maybe reach that nine months, um, you know, possibly a bit, a bit longer. So I was 36 um, I might kind of do slightly better than the average. But I found out there were very few outliers um, in, in 2016. So typically cancer patients with uh, colon cancer spread to the abdominal membrane got sort of seven to nine months of uh, life after diagnosis with treatment. So things were looking pretty bleak. Um, fortunately, a friend of mine... Eben Upton, who uh, you probably know of, um, he's uh, the my co-founder of uh, Raspberry Pi. He told me that there were still some of the HIV patients alive from like the f first waves of HIV in the nineteen eighties. He said what had happened was some patients would get access to new drugs through clinical trials. And this would give them a little bit longer to live. And then another trial would come up and they'd get a bit more time to live. And it's like they were kind of riding a wave of mm -hmm. new drugs. And of course, now HIV is manageable as a chronic disease. And in fact, recently, I think there's been some curative treatments as well. So... Um, that was my intention. Could I get access to some new treatments and live a bit longer um, and make it through this? Uh, as you might have gathered, um, I lived a lot longer than seven to nine months because I'm here now six years later. Um, so, yeah, my story is basically I realised there was no proper treatment in the UK I had the option of uh, treatment in Japan because I'd been spending the past um, like 
what past few years before the diagnosis I've been uh, dividing my time between the UK and Japan most of the time in Japan so I knew I could get treated in Japan and I had heard the cancer treatment and healthcare in general in Japan was considerably better. Um, I had not really had any healthcare in Japan, um, but I had heard it was very, very good. Cutting edge treatments, um, really high standard of clinical excellence everywhere in all parts of the healthcare system, um, with the notable exception of mental health, but that's a topic for another time. So I went uh, to Japan and started getting treated. Uh, I went through a lot of treatment. <laughs> Had four years of surgeries, chemotherapy, or various chemotherapies, molecular targeted therapy, various radiation therapies, uh, metabolic therapy. Um, I had hypothermia therapies, so heating up the cancer tumours to damage the cancer and make chemotherapy work better. So I basically had all the kinds of um, cancer treatments except for hormone treatment that wasn't relevant in uh, my case. After four years of doing seven kinds of treatment and doing many of them repeatedly, I got to the stage called NED, NED, No Evidence of Disease. And my immunotherapist said, you've got to this stage, um, but you should keep doing treatment for another year to make the chance of the cancer um, returning much lower. So I did um, another 12 months of uh, low dose chemotherapy. So this is chemotherapy where you have a low dose, but there are no breaks. It's just chemotherapy every day. Um, the side effects are better than regular chemotherapy, um, but it's still, yeah, kind of unpleasant. So now um, I'm a real outlier. Uh, my kind of case is actually going to be written um, as a paper by a Japanese surgeon and kind of provides... Um, a case study and a, and a pathway for patients to hopefully get curative cancer treatment. Uh, in my case, if I can stay with no evidence of disease for another year, um, so I've had two years so far, no evidence of this disease, and for the past year I've had no cancer treatment at all. If I can stay for another year, um, probably by getting some more immunotherapy, when I get to the three-year mark of no evidence for the disease, the chance of the cancer recurring uh, drops off dramatically um, for colon cancer. And that's different for different cancers. Some cancers, um, yeah, tend to um, recur in the first couple of years, colon cancer, first three years. But if I can make it to three years with no evidence of disease, then the chance of the cancer coming back um, drops off dramatically and then this story really could be um, a fairy tale not a nightmare so i'm going to just give you some background information of like understanding cancer um, and then i'm going to talk about my kind of blueprint for curing cancer and finally how you scale that cure so that everyone everywhere can get really effective cancer treatments um, there's obviously big financial barriers in, in some countries. So, um, background for cancer. So I'm going to explain what cancer is, um, why you should care, why there seems to be so much cancer around, and why is it so hard to treat, and particularly why does it seem impossible to cure. So what is cancer? Well, cancer is a group of diseases, and they seem to be diseases at the cell level, so to do with the cells of the body. This may not be correct. It may be more um, operating at a higher level. Um, there are various models for trying to understand cancer, but the cellular model um, seems to be the least useful. And it's a set of diseases that are to do with 
cell division and cell death. So what happens when cells divide, so when you get uh, new tissue growing? And what happens when cells are meant to die? And I think you can probably guess that, um, yeah, cancers, there are many issues with the cell division. Um, you see this here, this sort of rapidly dividing cells, these tumours growing inside people. And cell death, you hear about, um, people talk about the cells ignoring the signals to die um, or hiding from the immune system so the immune system doesn't kill them. Um, these kind of cells, when, when they become cancerous, they form these tumours and they spread. So there are non-cancerous tumours um, but the, one of the key points is that a non-cancerous tumour doesn't spread. It might grow, it might grow a lot, it might cause a problem if it's pushing against um, an organ or against some nerves or whatever. Um, but a non-cancerous tumour shouldn't spread around your body. Um, uh, non-cancerous tumours can become cancerous, so that's why, um, yeah, it's a good idea to get checked out medically quite regularly for that kind of thing. Um, so it's kind of unique that cancer can spread around the body. It's very odd because when rogue cells are like floating around in your blood or your lymphatic system, uh, they're recognised and they get killed. Um, if they make it to somewhere, they shouldn't be able to like stick on to the side of an organ and start multiplying and growing but cancer cells do right can cancer cells get past the many mechanisms that your body has against cancer so that's what cancer really is so it's it's a group of diseases we usually talk about cancer in terms of the organ it started in like where's the primary tumor um that may be um less useful in the future Maybe it's more important to look at the genetic mutation that caused the cancer. Um, we're not really sure yet. So I, I say we, um, I know quite a bit about cancer because I've got it, um, but yeah, I'm not a doctor. So um, I'm not giving any medical advice at any point in this talk. Um, and I never would give any medical advice because I'm not a doctor. Okay, so yeah, we talk about like where the primary tumour was. So in my case, for example, um, primary tumour was in the sigmoid colon, which is the S-shaped bit of your large intestine. And unfortunately, when my cancer was found, it had already spread to lymph nodes, liver, um, abdominal membrane. Uh, later, it spread to my right lung as well. Um, so next, why should you care? Well, the very short answer is that either you're going to get cancer or someone close to you will. Now, um, that's the reality in 2022. I'm yeah, working on changing that reality for you and uh, other people in the world. Um, more of that later. Um, but yeah, that's the reality basically is that you're going to get cancer or someone you know um, has or will get cancer and obviously we need to change that so what we need is effective cancer treatments that don't destroy your body and that are affordable for everyone everywhere so that's what I'm working on um, you can find out some of the stuff I'm doing from um, my website makecancerhistory.jp um, that's JP for Japan, so makecancerhistory.jp. If you want to find out more about my personal story and how I am alive <laughs> um, six years after um, a terminal diagnosis with seven to nine months to live, um, if you go to hackcancer.jp, so that's hackcancer.jp, that forwards to, um, like redirects to uh, my GoFundMe page, and you can see the updates there. I've done, I don't know, almost 100 videos about, um, well, over the past six years, I've been doing videos about the treatments I've been having and the 
results and that kind of thing. So if you go to hackcanter.jp, you can find out all about um, yeah my story. If you go to makecancerhistory.jp, you'll see the work I'm doing here in Tokyo um, to try and yeah make cancer history. So next question is like, why is cancer so common? Um, lots of high profile cancer cases. You, you certainly know people with cancer. Um, you have to be a bit careful because of course now, I say now, but recently we have a lot of social media. So we hear about things maybe um, that we wouldn't have heard about in the past. It does seem cancer is becoming more common in young people. Uh, that could be due to environmental factors. Um, it could be lifestyle issues. Um, there are kind of some odd things like the number of non-smokers who get lung cancer is going up. So maybe that's um, due to pollution, uh, maybe pol air pollution, obviously. Um, but it could be other forms of pollution as well, because some pollutants are co-carcinogens, so they work with other things to cause cancer so there could be pollution in water um, that's combining with other things in your body call it causing lung cancer for example um, and of course I mean people are living a lot longer now which is a fantastic thing um, but yeah in most countries there's rising life expectancy um, a lot of diseases that used to kill people are now um, yeah becoming controlled either as chronic diseases or in a few cases even cured so maybe that's a reason why cancer seems to be more common um, we also have a lot more detection and early detection uh, and screening you know that kind of thing so I think um, people are being picked up with screening is finding the cancer or people are going into the healthcare system with another disease and the cancer is discovered. In my case, my cancer was discovered just because of some side effects um, to an antibiotic. So I, I um, had a chest infection, got a very standard course of antibiotics, broad spectrum antibiotics, got a bad reaction. Doctor was a bit suspicious. She pushed me for some testing and um, lo and behold, terminal cancer. Not what I was expecting from a, a cough and some medicine. So finally, why is cancer so hard to treat and why does it seem almost impossible to cure? Well, it seem it is hard to treat because it's a group of diseases. So drugs for one type of cancer don't necessarily help with another type of cancer. Um, as cancer kind of grows and even spreads in the body, it's almost becoming diff a different disease. So like metastatic cancer, so cancer that's spread out of the body, out of where it started. Um, so that's like a generally a stage three or stage four cancer. It's fundamentally different as a disease to cancer that's in one place. Um, Another reason, I mean, think about my case, is that there's often no symptoms until the cancer spreads. So in my case, um, when I had these antibiotics, that caused some side effects because there was a big tumour in my intestine um, and which caused a lot of pain when I, I took those antibiotics. Um, so yeah, some, some cancer is almost only found in late stage. Uh, ovarian cancer tends to be no symptoms until it's, um, it's spread, which is, um, yeah, very upsetting. Um, other cancers are in kind of places where they can spread easily. So breast cancer tends to spread quite early, I think, because um, it can spread through the lymphatic system. So it has access to all, all, all those lymph nodes in the chest. Um, gets into the muscle wall, spreads through the body, gets into the bones. Um, yeah, so that's one reason. Um, another perhaps obvious reason is that the treatments are so brutal. Um, cancer treatment is, is horrific. Um, 
it's it's hard to describe just how unpleasant it is. Uh, radiation treatment that like burns your skin, uh, makes you go grey, it causes hair to fall out, maybe causes um, other tumours in your body. Um, chemotherapy that attacks anywhere in your body where um, cells are being replaced, like lining of the stomach, the intestine, all that kind of, you know, all those sort of parts of your body, um, hair follicles. Um, yeah, they're really, really, really nasty drugs. The treatments are really nasty. Cancer surgery. So um, surgeons do something called cytoreductive surgery where they, they basically cut out or burn out any visible cancer um, that they, they, they can safely remove. Now, in my case, the cancer had spread a lot. So... Yeah, six hours of surgery with the, the surgeon hunting around to see what he could um, safely cut out. And then, of course, with cancers like um, colon cancer, you tend to have bits of your intestine removed. Uh, maybe your intestines can be reconnected afterwards. Very often they can't. So you have a colostomy bag where the intestine comes out of the wall of your stomach and uh, of the abdominal wall. Sorry. And... Uh, attaches to a plastic bag to collect waste that you have to empty many times a day. Um, I had that for five years, had a reversal surgery done a year ago, but I still have, you know, short intestine, big, big bit of my intestine removed. That causes trouble every single day of my life from, from now onwards. Um, with breast cancer, removing um, either part of, um, part of the breast, maybe a, a lumpectomy, but um, or, you know, whole um, mastectomy. Again, with lung cancer, if it's a, an isolated tum tumour, a surgeon can do a wedge resection, take out a little bit of lung, um, could have to remove a whole lobe of the lung or an entire lung. So um, patients gen generally have to um, stop <laughs> treatment because, well, either they die um, or because the treatment is just so brutal. The side effects and the damage to the body is just is just too tough. So how about actually getting to a cure and sorting out um, some of this mess that is cancer treatment? So obviously, well, not obviously, but it's important to say that some people are cured of cancer. Like cancer is a curable disease and it seems that most types of cancer are curable and there are people who have been cured possibly in two years time I'll be giving a talk at hope again and I'll be saying semi-confidently that I'm a terminal patient who was cured but the percentage of patients cured is very very low and especially the percentage of late stage patients cured is almost zero. Now I have to state again I'm not a doctor, um, I'm not pretending to be one, I'm a patient who has gone through a lot of treatment, I've studied cancer a lot, I've talked to lots of doctors, I've talked to cancer researchers, I've talked to hundreds of patients and I and quite a few Japanese uh, cancer specialists have a observed something in Japan over the past few years, in my case over the past six years, um, which is the time I have been very unwillingly involved in cancer. I basically observed that there are four things that help cancer patients uh, live longer and potentially even get cured. So the first thing is the condition of the patient's immune system. Right, so that's really a key thing because it's the immune system that cures the cancer, I believe, at this time. Meaning that um, when you have, can let's say you have cancer surgery and the cancer hasn't spread, a surgeon removes the tumour and then... <laughs> 
you have this um, microscopic disease left behind. Uh, you may have cancer cells floating around the body called uh, circulating tumour cells. And the immune system hopefully can deal with those and the cancer doesn't recur. The problem with this is that when you have surgery, there's a lot of immune suppression. Right? So it suppresses the immune system a lot. If you have radiotherapy, it suppresses the immune system a lot. If you have chemotherapy, it suppresses the immune system a lot. Now, if you have radiotherapy or chemotherapy, that kills some of the cancer cells. The immune system can see this, hopefully, and starts attacking cancer cells. So you can see there's kind of this, um, like, a balance, like seesaw kind of balance between the cancer treatment killing cancer cells, which is obviously good and particularly destroying tumours that were damaging the patient, um, but also causing immune suppression. So the condition of the immune system is really, really important. And then access to the newest treatments. It just seems to be a recurring theme when you look at long-term cancer survivors. They got the newest treatments, clinical trials, um, or just just the latest treatments available or using old treatments but in newer ways right that's that William Gibson quote the future's already here it's just not evenly distributed the next thing that seems to be a key factor is the total amount of treatment so can the patient deal with more and more treatment especially yeah chemotherapy or this molecular targeted therapy can they have a lot of immunotherapy um, so you can see already how these factors are, are related because um, more treatment, if they're treatments that damage the immune system, then that's going to like tip the balance in the wrong direction. Um, and the fourth thing is the variety of treatments. So long term survivors tend to have a wide variety of treatments. So there, there are eight ways of treating cancer at the moment. I've had seven of them. Um, and within those ways of treating cancer, so chemotherapy being one, I've had a whole cocktail of different chemotherapies and molecular targeted therapies. Um, I've had two types of radiation therapy. Um, so a lot of varieties of treatment seems to be a key factor and that's probably because it stops the cancer being able to evolve. Like one of the reasons why cancer survives and patients don't is that the cancer evolves very quickly. A very simple Darwinian evolution, right? You have a cancer treatment, it kills 90% of the cancer cells in your body. The remaining 10% happen to be resistant to that treatment and that forms a new population of cancer cells. Um, yeah, so having a big variety of treatments seems really important. So those kind of four um, factors, I guess you could call them, they suggest to us what a cure should look like, right? Combination of treatments, treatments that have less impact on the patient, particularly um, on the immune system um, and treatments like with a view to having more treatment in the future kind of admitting that if the patient's going to survive they're probably going to need a whole series of treatments so we should carefully choose the treatments that are going to keep the patient in a good condition so finally I mean how would you scale this kind of thing and make it into a proper cure um well you know some countries have almost no cancer treatment right so many countries in africa for example there'll be no radiotherapy or there'll be one radiotherapy machine for a country of 20 million or whatever um place like malawi there's almost no cancer treatment there some countries have really great cancer treatment, but it's very uh, uneven um, in terms of access. So the US would be a good example. There are some 
you know, fantastic cancer treatments in the US, um, but not accessible for the majority of Americans. Um, cancer patients I know in the US who are terminal say that generally in the US you need about a million dollars um, as a terminal patient to kind of um, like live um, as long as possible with your cancer, right? So if, if you wanted to do the best, get the best treatments, whatever, um, it's going to cost you about a million dollars. Um, yeah, so it's very uh, uneven treatment. In other countries, the treatment is uneven depending on cancer type and age of patients. So in the UK, for example, really good surgical technique, um, quite poor in other areas of healthcare um, related to cancer. So overall, um, quite poor cancer care. Um, I don't like saying that, I'm British. Um, but yeah, I would not be alive six years later if I'd stayed in the UK for treatment, absolutely not. If, if I was an amazing case, maybe would have lasted um, a year, year and a half, um, if I was one of those amazing outliers in the UK, certainly wouldn't have been here six years because most of the treatments I've had are not available in the UK. Some that are just the, the quality uh, in the UK is, is poor um, compared to what I've, I've had in Japan. So one thing that we really need to do is, is use refactoring. So we need to look at treatments that we've already got, that, that treatments that are effective or um, more effective than not. Um, maybe would be be a more honest way of putting that, but refactor them. So without changing the treatment outcome, find a way to make the treatment more accessible, particularly cheaper. Um, so th and that goes for other um, medical technology. So things like the CT scanners and the PET scanners, um, MRI scanners, they are massive machines, they're very expensive. They're not um, improving over the years. They're still massive and expensive, have very high power consumption. Um, they're so heavy, they are often in the basements of hospitals. So we need to um, refactor those, re-engineer those. Um, treatment machines, radiotherapy machines make cheaper versions, um, you know, looking at open source solutions. Um, we need to look at cancer drugs where the patents have expired and then you can make a biosimilar drug which is a slight alteration um, but the drug functions in the same way and that could be done by non-profit organizations <clears throat> um, and again we could we could sort of have open open source drugs <clears throat> um, especially one thing we need to do is is share knowledge among cancer patients and doctors and researchers so that's one of the big areas I'm working on so yeah I educate <clears throat> cancer patients around the world I run free online seminars about treatments I have um, yeah provide information for doctors as well and yeah I'm working on getting doctors patients and researchers together to share the knowledge Obviously, in, in the tech community, we know a lot about community and knowledge sharing. Um, but in the medical community, um, well, I'm not even going to call it a community, but um, there's a lot less um, skill uh, when it comes to sharing knowledge, right? Um, researchers are publishing medical papers instead of making wikis where people can annotate and add comments and edit things, for example. Um, you know, we need to get medical professionals coming to hacker conferences instead of just talking to each other at medical conferences. Um, so as I said before, like if you go to um, makecancerhistory.jp, you can uh, see some of the work I'm doing. You can get in touch with me. Um, and if you go to hackcancer.jp, you can find out more about 
yeah, my personal situation. You can uh, watch educational videos on living and dying with cancer. Um, I'm always very open to questions and uh, contacts. So find me online, get in touch with me, ask me questions. Um, if you want to help, get in touch. Uh, if you need help, obviously get in touch as well. Um, because, yeah, I'm working hard to make a real difference to how cancer patients get treated. So thank you ever so much for your attention. I deeply appreciate it. And uh, please do get in touch um, either via hackcancer.jp or makecancerhistory.jp uh, or just look me up online, Cara Moon. You'll find me on Twitter and yeah, all those other ridiculous social media things. Thanks a lot. And we are and we're live with Kara Moon right now. If anyone has any questions for our speaker, please feel free to come to the microphone over here so that we can make sure all of our friends around the world as well as our speaker can hear your question. We also have some questions in from the Matrix chat. Um, there's a couple of questions. Again, if, you're, if you don't want to answer these questions because they do, these two are a little bit uh, on the sensitive side feel free to not answer them. The first one um, from from Zap was wondering how old you are. Okay, um, so I am now 42. Uh, so when I was diagnosed, I was 36. Um, yeah, so 36 is kind of quite young to be told you've got maybe seven to nine months to live. And uh, yeah, I'm surprised and very happy to be still alive now. <laughs> six years later. And we're very happy that you're still alive as well. And I, congratulations on getting through so far. Thank you. Can you share, um, this question is from The One Wolf. Could you share the order of magnitude how much the cancer treatment has cost over the years? Um, okay, so first of all, I should say that I'm uh, in Japan where we have public health insurance so a lot of my treatment is covered by public health insurance. Uh, in Japan, we contribute 30% to the cost, but that's capped as well. Like there's a monthly maximum. Um, I was a freelance worker, so my income dropped basically to zero when I got diagnosed and needed treatment. So, um, yeah, my, my monthly medical bill for standard treatment was maybe a couple of hundred dollars a month um, because it's limited by the Japanese government. All the kind of high tech stuff like proton beam therapy and immunotherapy, um, that's not covered by public health insurance in Japan. Those are kind of cutting edge treatments. So I did crowdfunding for that. Um, so I think it's probably somewhere around $100,000. Maybe my life is worth that. I don't know. But uh, it's a scarily big number. Um, but yeah, something like that, around $100,000. Hi, I think you kind of answered what I was about to ask, but I was about to ask to what degree was your treatment of cancer in Japan standard for Japan and to what degree it was because uh, you received some experimental treatment or uh, you simply fought to... Uh, get the best treatment possible. Yeah, so um, my my treatment was very much a mixture of like standard treatment and yeah, you could say experimental treatments, um, especially combinations of treatments. I was quite fortunate that my oncologists understood that the like the standard treatment protocol for stage four patients um, doesn't have a happy ending, right? It's not um, treatment with curative intent it's like palliative treatment kind of they're trying to keep you alive a bit and minimize your symptoms so I think yeah the my oncologists were quite open-minded um, about that and I found a fantastic immunotherapist who is considered the father of immunotherapy in Japan so it'd be uh, similar to Dr. Rosenberg in the US who invented immunotherapy um, 
so yeah, I had a, a mixture, and I think having a mixture of treatments is really, really important. Um, I don't mean a mixture of treatments that work and don't work. I mean a mixture of um, science-based, reality-based treatments, um, maybe some that don't make a great deal of difference, but that help other treatments work, um, or just prevent the, the cancer from becoming uh, resistant to treatment, which generally cancer does. I mean, it's very, very basic evolution. If you um, try and kill a, a population of cells and some survive, they're going to go on and make, um, make more cells. So that's what you're dealing with with late stage cancer. User ML9991-2494 asks, can you share about the non-medical side of things and how that has helped you with your cancer recovery, such as a support network, mental health, caregivers, et cetera? Sure. Um, so the hacker community have been massively supportive. Um, that's helped a lot with the mental health, but also the uh, what's called the financial toxicity. So cancer is a very expensive disease to deal with, not just the cost of medical treatment, but things like um, you know, transport to, to various hospitals. If you're looking for the best possible treatment, might be quite far away. I spent um, two months going uh, every week, like uh, by bullet train to a hospital in the north of Japan for proton beam therapy. Um, so that's a like two hour by a bullet train from Tokyo. Um, so those kind of costs are massive. So the, su the support of the hacker community um, ha has been really big, like um, Rob T. Firefly uh, arranged an interview for me on Off the Hook. Manuel has been really supportive. Mitch Altman has helped with fundraising. A bicycle Mark, um, who does a, a Citizen Reporter podcast, he's done a lot of interviews with me, um, which has shared my story, and mentally has yeah made a big difference. Just having um, that outlet to kind of talk about what was going on, or what is still going on. Um, I also uh, started a YouTube channel. I'm not particularly a fan of Google, but um, yeah, doing those videos helped a lot with mental health. Um, trying to stay in the best possible physical shape um, so that you can tolerate more treatment. That's really hard to do when you're on heavy chemotherapy, the side effects are brutal, but um, yeah, trying to, to stay fit has um, yeah, made a big difference, I think. Any more questions? Uh you talked about working with the immune system. Thoughts on countering uh, cancer's native immune innovations? So, you know, we, we've got a couple of things to deal with. So we've got, well, we've got like the, the cancer kind of um, suppresses the activity of the immune system. So one way is it may be um, forcing down the number of white blood cells um, cancer can kind of suck in white blood cells into the tumors as well. Then also cancer cells are able to hide from the immune system by not presenting antigens. Um, and also the kind of the consequences of the tumor microenvironment mean that it's um, difficult for the immune system to uh, attack the tumors. So that's, you know, one approach is to have a variety of treatments. So for example, I had NK cell based immunotherapy. NK cells can attack bacteria, they can attack viruses, they can attack cancer cells presenting antigens, so that's like labeled as bad cells, but also cancer cells that are not presenting antigens. We hear a lot in the media about T cell immunotherapy, but T cells can only attack cells that are um, presenting antigens. I took a um, diabetes drug called met metformin. Um, I don't have diabetes, but it seems a side effect of the drug is it inhibits anaerobic respiration. That means um, it stops or it reduces the cancer tumor's anaerob anaerobic respiration the anaerobic respiration protects the tumor because uh, lactic acid forms in the tumor microenvironment and that um, destroys the immune cells, um, the white blood cells that are going in to attack it. 
Uh, we also did hypothermia therapy. So that means heating up the tumors so they get um, heat shock proteins forming on the surface of the cells and your immune system can recognize that. So there's a, there's a bunch of approaches to try and um, make the cancer more visible um, to the immune system. I also had a dendritic cell therapy. Dendritic cells um, are the ones that look a bit like octopuses and they get bits of dead and dying bad cells and they take them to your lymph nodes and they present them to the T cells and NK cells. So I had the uh, dendritic therapy. Um, and then the other big thing was um, the autologous therapies of using my white blood cells. So removing some of those, growing them in the lab until they were maybe a billion times more and then having those like return to me as a drip. So doing that to massively increase the number of white blood cells um, in my body. So yeah, those are some of the approaches. Um, but yeah, it's, it's the immune system that has the ability to cure cancer ultimately, I think. So we have to also choose um, therapies that are not gonna trash the immune system. Um, radiation destroys white blood cells. Uh, chemo <laughs> destroys white blood cells. So using those treatments very carefully. Um, cancer surgery causes massive uh, immunosuppression. Um, so just being very careful about choosing therapies and timing them so that the patient isn't um, yeah, gonna be completely trashed. But, uh, great question. Uh, hello, uh, first of all, thanks for uh, coming to take the time out to uh, speak to us. Uh, I had a question. So when you started your journey about like, you know, when they told you your condition up and, you know, you went along and started learning and experiencing more of these treatments and started learning about particularly the uh, the trade offs in the quality of life, like, hey, I have to take this medication. It does X, Y and Z for me, but it also makes me feel like this and this uh, in your times of deepest struggle when you know, you're like, oh, wow, these trade offs are this is like really big. This is my life. Like in, in your greatest times of struggle, how have you gotten through uh, and, and, you know, carried on and be like, well, no, I'm going to keep I'm going to keep trying. I'm going to keep, you know, living my life. Yeah. So that is yeah by far the hardest thing. And it's it's very difficult just based on time. Right. So when you have terminal cancer, you're extremely busy because a, you're trying to live your life as much as possible. And in my case, particularly trying to spend as much time with my, my kids and teaching them to pick locks and pack and all those important life skills. But I'm also, yeah, rushing around looking for hospitals, finding doctors that will um, speak to me about the, the cutting edge treatments, the experimental treatments. Um, so I think, yeah, one thing was that when I got annoyed and angry, which happened quite a lot, trying to um, redirect that into taking action. So the, the, like there's this, um, this saying that motion beats meditation. Um, and I, I believe that very strongly that taking action is the key thing. Um, in my case, it was often making a crummy YouTube video where I tried to talk through the um, hell that I was in. Um, so yeah, kind of when, when I was in my, my darkest moments, um, it was really thinking like, what can I actually do? Is there a question I can ask someone that might make some, you know, result in some useful information? Um, is there a way I can do some crowdfunding to pay for some treatment? So instead of kind of, um, dwelling on things, which is like, um, something I would do by, by my nature. Um, trying really hard to turn that into action. Um, another really big thing is, is like being reflective and realizing that there's a whole load of bad stuff happening, but the, the worst thing is like the result of all that. So what I mean by that, for example, is when we don't have much sleep, um, everything is screwed up. <laughs> Right, so often I was, um, yeah, really at the point of giving up, 
And I had to kind of remind myself that at least part of that was sleep deprivation because I'd spend nights vomiting on the chemo um, or, you know, after the surgery, I was in pain a lot. And um, I had a, a chemo drug that the um, I was given like a steroid to stop the fatigue and the side effect of the steroid was uncontrollable sneezing. So you might sneeze for like an hour, um, you know, a few days after surgery. So you've got, you feel like the stitches are ripping open. Um, I, I can smile about it now, but it was, yeah, fucking unpleasant. Um, but kind of being reflective and realizing that, yeah, there's, there's sleep deprivation, there's problems with not being able to eat. So often, um, again, with those steroids, right, you're given steroids to stop the fatigue. They make you feel hungry. The chemo makes all the food taste disgusting, right? It attacks the inside of your mouth. It attacks the nerves in your tongue. Um, had this uh, side effect of first bite syndrome where it bite food and it would send like lightning shocks into your brain. Um, so yeah, pretty, pretty grim stuff, but always like looking where, where I could take action, whereas like meaningful action, which may be, yeah, emailing a doctor or researcher saying like, this is my situation, what can you recommend or that kind of thing. Um, do we have time for another question? Maybe it's the next, yeah. next week. Buddy. Are the body scans, blood tests, DNA tests effective for, let's call it like elective or non-medically required scans to pick up on potential issues? Um, mm, so there's a lot there. Um, the DNA tests um, at the moment are pretty unreliable, um, but may like, so if we're talking in, in terms of screening, right? So th those kind of tests like um, uh, full genome testing, um, circulating tumor cells, these kind of tests that we call uh, liquid biopsies, um, they are not particularly reliable because um, like the companies make claims about accuracy we know it's not true because if you send the same samples to different companies, you get different results. So someone's not telling the whole truth. Where they are useful is like as a first step of staging. So you might um, take a liquid biopsy and something is elevated or it suggests there's um, some tumor, circulating tumor cells. And then a next stage after that would be um, uh, traditional like biomarkers and maybe a CT scan or PET scan. Um, if you are older, then these things make far more sense, right? So if you're young, I mean, your chances of getting cancer when you're young are low, possibly increasing recently, but still low. Most cancers, you know, in, in the over 60s. Um, so those, those kind of early screening tests are um, much more helpful for older people because there's, if you get a positive result, there's more chance that really is cancer. Um, the scans uh, like CT scans, PET scans, uh, they obviously expose you to some radiation. Um, again, if you're older, that's less of an issue. Um, if you're younger and in intending to be involved in having children or whatever in the future, then yeah, that's of, of a concern. So those, those, um, those screening tests, are useful as part of a process. They're not um, reason to panic uh, in themselves, right? If you do one of these um, quick, uh, rapid genome sequencing and it says like, you've got all these mutations, you're probably gonna get cancer. Um, that's not something to, to be uh, particularly concerned about. Um, yeah, because they're just not that accurate at the moment. They may hopefully change it at some point in the future. Once again, I want to say thank you for sharing this with us. It's, it has been one of the more uh, amazing uh, medical talks that we've had at this event. And thank you for coming and joining us.